is that we are going to start a new topic. In fact, we're going to start a new chapter. And um, it's a chapter that, um, that I think since the Dobbs decision, um, I realized that I have to teach it just a little bit differently because of some things that you'll see uh, when we get to chapter 10 in the next book. Um, some different words and phrases that are used by the court that could potentially become problematic for some other decisions as well. So um, you can see that these are the pages that the chapter covers. And uh, our first lecture here, lecture six, looks at the uh, uh, development and growth of this doctrine. So kind of looking at the introduction development of this, and then we have three cases, the Slaughterhouse case, Munn versus Illinois, and Algier versus Louisiana. So we'll cover about 16, 17 pages worth of material today. So one thing is, due process um, has a long history. It goes back to the Magna Carta, um, where, and, um, and then later a law in Britain about uh, 130 years later, saying that no man shall be put out of his lands or tenements, nor taken, nor disinherited, nor put to death, without he be brought to answer by due process of law. So, one thing is, is that um, if you look at the terms due process, you see them um, a couple places. So you see them in the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Then the thing is, um, trying to apply it to the states, we see similar language coming in place in the 14th Amendment. Though one thing that you will see in this course um, is this. The 14th and the 15th Amendment, we, so we cover the 15th Amendment just a little bit. Um, early on, uh, the courts really were giving not a lot of power to enforce these. So not so not really enforcing the 14th and 15th Amendments like they probably should have. So one of the things about, you know, when we're talking about due process, um, economic substantive due process unreasonably arbitrarily denies the rights that are inherent to the freedom of an individual. Which the thing is, you know, when you're talking about um, procedural due process, you know, there are certain procedures that are put um, out there that, um, that let's say, if the government is going to do something to you, that the government has to follow, and if they don't, it's a violation of your due process rights. So, you know, for so we're not, we don't study in this course, but I'll tell you um, the right to criminal discovery. Violating that on the part of the prosecution uh, the court has found is a violation of procedural due process. Um, originally, some things on the right to counsel were more under procedural due process than under the Sixth Amendment. But one of the things is that when you're talking about the substantive due process, it's more goals versus procedures. So liberty and fairness. So one of the problems is with this is that these are potentially rights that are not explicitly written in the Constitution. So, you know, one thing that um, I think you kind of uh, saw, you know, from the Warren Court um, on was that often conservatives were charging um, more liberal courts with judicial activism. Now, I think what we're seeing, uh, you know, lately with this conservative supermajority on the court is that whenever whenever one side has a lot of votes on the court, um, they will use those votes to uh, push certain agendas. So, um, you know, it's not just as John Roberts said during his confirmation hearings, calling the balls and strikes. Um, you know, it does uh, presidential elections and elections to the Senate do have, do have, um, what do you call it, uh, consequences. So the fact that Donald Trump was elected in 2016 and defeated Hillary Clinton and that Republicans held the Senate for all four years of his presidency had a big effect. 
it gave us Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Now, maybe somebody should have told the um, people that voted for Jill Stein in 2016 that said, you know, oh, oh, Hillary, you know, we don't want Hillary, uh, you know, she's no better than Trump, we might as well have Trump. Um, you know, I don't think too many people on the Green Party side um, maybe wanted to overturn Roe v. Wade, um, but that's what happened. So, one of the problems was that um, this was used along with a number of other things, as I always call it, tools in the toolbox, to strike down a lot of uh, more progressive legislation. Um, occasionally there was some more conservative legislation, but this was often more progressive, progressive era, populist era, um, liberal type of legislation designed to really um, rein in big business, to give consumers more power, to give workers more power. But the thing is, you know, um, if, if, you know, if you're talking about, um, let's say, giving, you know, consumers more power, it, it might be at the expense of corporations. It might be at the expense of the wealthy. So one of the things that this ties in with, um, some things you would learn in Political Science 303, which um, some of you may have taken in the past, maybe with me or in the future, or you might have even had Professor Hinkle. So the court used other things. Um, so this was over a longer period of time, but delegation of powers, the Commerce Clause, taxing and spending power in the Tenth Amendment. Now, what I will tell you is, that while I don't think the economic substance due process necessarily is going to make as big of a comeback, because I'll tell you that um, of the first case that we're going to read, the slaughterhouse cases, one of the, um, oh, or let me actually just hold off on that, um, on some things. So uh, just to tell you, Justice Clarence Thomas, um, really not a big fan of uh, unenumerated powers. So unenumerated powers are part of the Ninth Amendment. Um, you know, what, you, what you're going to see when we get to chapter 10 in the next book is that some of the conservative justices are going to say, oh, they're talking about the liberty clause of the due process. Ah, it sounds a lot like a Lochner doctrine. So one thing that we're going to see is, um, and, um, and frankly you would see in most constitutional law courses, is that when the makeup of the court changes. The law changes. It's not necessarily supposed to be like that. Like I said, you know, is it supposed to be just calling the balls and the strikes? But if my judicial philosophy fundamentally is that this and this and this, I'm going to interpret those amendments to the Constitution in that way. So before the Civil War, people were entitled to fair and orderly um, um, procedure. Now, where we start to get um, kind of talking more about property rights. Now, the thing is, there are property rights that we have. You know, I think that you probably saw that you kind of see that with the contract clause, and you'd see it in the next chapter with um, the takings clause. But what about property rights kind of coming in and around due process? So government interfering in your property rights. Um, so can the government interfere in your property rights? Um, I guess it probably depends on who's on the Supreme Court at the time. So Chief Justice Roger Tawney and Dred Scott, um, the Dred Scott case, um, which uh, we'll uh, consider um, in the next book, said this, an act of Congress which deprives a citizen of the United States of his liberty or property a.k.a. a slave, merely because he came himself or brought his property into a particular territory, could hardly be dignified with the name due process law. So, you know, the, one of the big problems with that is that you're considering people property. Now, the good thing is that we have the 13th Amendment. We have the 13th Amendment. And it barred slavery and uh, indentured servitude and any of the uh, um, badges of slavery. Now, we saw also <coughs> about that time in Wyhamer versus the people, a court in 
New York struck down a prohibition law saying that due process guarantees um, prohibit, regardless of the manner of procedure, a certain kind of degree of exertion of legislation altogether, and that the substantive content of the legislation is covered not simply by the mode of procedure. So what Wayhammer is saying there, and again, it's a New York court, is that due process is not just procedure. It goes beyond that. So it's really saying that the government does not have the right to basically interfere in kind of business relationships and things. Now, one thing that I think you have to kind of think about is that, you know, we, um, the government has certain police powers. Government has police powers. They have powers over health and safety and different things. Um, this is kind of, uh, making it where government does not have very much power. Now, the thing that I always kind of tell people to remember is this. Um, you know, whenever we're talking about, okay, the government doing this, the government doing that, it's the government that people elected. So whether you like the decisions or not, so there are a number of decisions, let's say, I like, um, that the government makes or versus not what the government makes. And, you know, we can t we could have a discussion all day long, and you probably could when you get to Chapter 15 in the, at the end of the course. Um, you know, are some of our electoral procedures, do they have some flaws in it? I think that they do. Um, but it's the system that we have, and you have people that are duly elected, um, let's say the federal government, the state government, you know, we could talk about gerrymandering and some issues there. But are you going to deny elected representatives? Or let's say if you have initiative or referendum, you're going to deny the vote of the people to do things. Now, the 14th Amendment is going to come into play. Um, one of the things that um, the 14th, we'll talk about the 14th Amendment in more detail in the next book. But one thing to kind of keep in mind is that the 14th Amendment, you had a very, you had a, you actually still had a very conservative court. You know, Lincoln didn't really get, Lincoln had some um, decent appointees, then you had Johnson. Um, you just didn't have, um, a lot of the Supreme Court appointees really didn't match necessarily some of the philosophy of the presidents that were appointing them kind of in that early period. So, so not really as much Lincoln, Grant, um, Hayes, uh, kind of folks on the court. So, so you ended up with, uh, just a very laissez fair pro business, pro wealthy court. Um, but the, the Congress was worried. The radical Republicans were worried that, um, the 14th, that, that um, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which had been um, approved over President Andrew Johnson's veto, would be found to be unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So if you're going to worry something's going to be unconstitutional, stick it in the Constitution. So a lot of what it did was to um, apply um, some of the language of the Fifth Amendment to the states. Now, now there's a lot more to it than just that. Um, but another thing that was kind of going on is that, you know, the Taney court had um, really um, taken the contract clause um, and really lopped it down quite a bit. So remember that that was more looking at what state and local governments were doing. So what could you maybe do to uh, <clears throat> stop more progressive and populist legislation out of the states. So the 14th Amendment, which, you know, we just, if, if you look at the 14th Amendment, what was the purpose of the 14th Amendment? I mean, if you look at each of the amendments to the Constitution we've had since the Bill of Rights, there are clear purposes. It was to protect a lot of the rights of former slaves. You know, the Dred Scott decision said that people of African ancestry were never intended to ever be citizens of the United States. 
um, you know, states could make you a citizen of their state. So it was designed to overturn that, but it was designed to protect a lot of their rights. So one of the questions is, um, a lot of people that uh, like big business and the wealthy started thinking, hey, this thing that was uh, designed to help um, former slaves, maybe we can make it where it helps us. So instead of uh, it, so instead of uh, um, aggressively protecting the rights of African Americans in the country, let's use it to protect the rights of big business corporations and the wealthy. So there was some there was some thinking though. Did the Fourteenth Amendment apply to everybody or just a few people? So, some of the reasons the court moves in these directions. So, Sam and Chase was the Chief Justice that was appointed by Lincoln in 1864 to replace Roger Taney after he died. So, Taney, sir, T so Taney was the Chief Justice during most of the Civil War. Um, even though he's a slave owner, he did not defect to the Confederacy. I'm sure he had probably um, sympathies for them. But he was a Marylander. Uh, Maryland did not secede. There were a number of people in Maryland who would have liked to seceded. Um, so Sam and Chase um, was a leader on the court. But the next three chief justices, um, White, Fuller, and White, were not strong leaders. They did not really lead the court. The Democratic Party is not the Democratic Party of today by any means whatsoever. It was largely conservative. So Grover Cleveland, one of his big things. So, I mean, just think about this. Between 1860 and 1912, until you get Woodrow Wilson, Grover Cleveland was the only Democratic president serving two non-consecutive terms. And, you know, Grover Cleveland was basically, eh, the government doesn't need to be doing a whole lot of stuff. The Republican Party is more split, tend to favor business. So Lincoln and Grant did have some... Uh, some appointees to the court that shared more of their views, but a lot of subsequent ones were more conservative and shared a lot of the social Darwinism um, um, views and uh, uh, about government intervention in the economy. Basically, you know, social Darwinism, uh, um, probably there's somebody listening to this that probably likes it or maybe doesn't like it. Um, I'm sure there's mixed opinions on it, but it's kind of more a laissez-faire. That, um, you know, just get the government out of stuff. You know, don't let the government get involved. Now, I think one of the questions, of course, that, that you have to consider in any constitutional law course is that there are certain things that are just completely unconstitutional. So if, if, the, Congress, um, if the Congress passed a law that said um, the Presbyterian religion is the... Uh, national religion. Clearly, that's unconstitutional. But what about things where, you know, we're using some type of doctrine that's maybe a little bit questionable to overturn the will of elected representatives? So, are we, are we, are you kind of, uh, you know, you just think about it. I mean, big business and corporations already have, um, already have a, a number of advantages. Um, if you kind of think about it, because, uh, of course, uh, you know, in a in a country where, um, you know, you can um, you can, let's say, uh, contribute money, contribute a lot of money. Um, and one thing is, well, at the very end of this course, we'll, we'll look at campaign finance, where the Supreme Court has eviscerated campaign finance rules. But. You know, the wealthy just have a lot more influence, um, even though, it, I mean, it's kind of the paradox that uh, because they have so much money, it can, influ can influence things. They can, their, their views often can override that of uh, kind of the majority of the public on some things, you know, and they can, they can use their money and things to influence that. So we kind of see these laissez-faire court, the pro-business court. Sometimes people call it the Industrial Revolution Court. You really don't start to get much uh, um, progressive um, 
pushback that that at least um, is very strong. I mean, the thing is, you can have somebody that, let's say, dissents in some things um, until really Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis enter the court. Um, you know, and to and to some degree uh, on a few things, Justice uh, John Marshall Harlan the first. Um, now, now one thing is is that by the time that William Howard Taft becomes the Chief Justice, so William Howard Taft, I think um, people sometimes think that Taft, okay, oh yeah, he was this real big conservative that comes after Theodore Roosevelt. I think some of that is because Theodore Roosevelt runs against him in 1912. You know, he was easily elected in 1908 with Roosevelt's endorsement. But Taft did a lot of uh, things that Roosevelt did. I mean, he, there were some things that Roosevelt would have liked to have done further, maybe in his presidency. But, you know, Taft was kind of, uh, Taft was kind of more in the center when he gets on the court. But you'd had so many conservatives appointed um, and, uh, in, 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 in those eras and, um, you know, Wilson's nominees were a mixed bag. So remember, Woodrow Wilson, considered very progressive on some things, uh, civil rights and race, not so much. Um, but, you know, conservatives were in strong control of the court. So our first case comes from the great state of Louisiana, the Pelican State. So some of the background here is that um, the United States... Um, one thing about this country is that until pretty recently, um, you saw really big increases in percentage, percentage increases in the population of the country. Um, you know, after, during the Civil War, you didn't really see as much immigration into the country um, because, you know, hmm, let's see, do we want to, uh, okay, it's not that great in Europe, but do we want to go to this country that's fighting a civil war? Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, so after the Civil War, a trend that had happened before the Civil War rapidly increases, and that is industrialization. Um, the economy is getting more diversified. Uh, the economy is expanding. You know, the population is expanding. You know, we really don't see, we really don't see the first, um, um, attempts really to restrict non-European immig uh, immigration from Europe until the 1920s. So, you know, it was kind of um, like if, if, if you're in Europe and you want to come to the United States, if you were not from Europe, there was a much different story there. Uh, basically, if you, were, if you were white and you're from Europe, if you want to come to the United States, um, basically you have to get here, um, you know, not be, you know, not be, um, you know, contagious with the any major diseases. And even if you were, they probably just quarantine you for a while. You know, almost everybody that came to Ellis Island when it was open got in. Um, so, you know, that's a story for another day about immigration policy in the United States. But um, one thing that rapid industrialization brings during this period of time, because you didn't really have, um, you know, people really weren't thinking about pollution at the time. You know, people weren't really thinking about what are you putting in the air? What are you putting in the water? So... The state of Louisiana said that butchers taking, dumping animal parts and garbage in the Mississippi River were polluting it. Now, if you've ever been to New Orleans, or if you could maybe look at a map of the United States of America, what you might see is, is that between the Rocky, roughly, between the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains, basically most of the major, most of the rivers eventually work themselves into the Mississippi River. Not all of them. Some of them go different directions. Some of them go in the great. Some, they go in different directions, but most of them. So, so the Missouri River and the Ohio River. You just think about all the rivers that flow into the Missouri and the Ohio River, um, and then other rivers that flow into the Mississippi, like uh, the Red River. Um, it's almost that when you get to New Orleans, it's not New Orleans isn't right on the uh, Gulf. You know, it's another um, I think about sixty miles downstream. You're already getting, um, you're already getting pollution from St. Louis, Louisville, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh. 
you're getting a lot of basically all the kind of crap that um, flows down in there eventually is going to get to New Orleans. And then you're adding other things down there by the butchers. So I'm kind of like, ah, yeah, ah, we don't have a trash can. Let's just throw it in the river. You know, so the Mississippi River already has, uh, you know, even even if you're having some good regulations, you're already having some problems. So to, cr to remedy it, or actually to create a monopoly, the legislature created a central slaughterhouse in New Orleans to receive and slaughter all livestock for 25 years. The butchers were forced to use this company and its facilities to slaughter and had to pay a high pr higher prices for the privilege. So they sued. So uh, some of the question is, did this violate the 13th and 14th Amendments? So you actually heard me right. You actually heard me right. That some of them are saying this violated the law against slavery. Because I'll just tell you this. Um, uh, you know what is very similar to slavery? Slavery. Nothing else. You know, whenever I hear people try to compare things to slavery, I'm kind of like, No. No, full stop. You know, I had one person try to, oh, like the welfare system is slavery. No, it's not. I don't think anybody's whipping you on the back and owning me. So, slavery, not slavery. So, the Butcher's Benevolent Association. It's a nice group name. Kind of like, uh, um, you know, you know. I mean, the, you know, the thing is in, in, uh, in New York, some of our... Um, you know, not necessarily police. I mean, maybe they are unions, but uh, the PBA is the Police Benevolent Association. I never thought about the Butchers Benevolent Association. They're saying that the 13th, 14th Amendment apply to all Americans. Um, that Americans have the right to engage in a useful business or occupation and right to an income that flows from their efforts. Um, that forcing them to use just this one slaughterhouse in New Orleans, in Orleans Parish, violates in the provision against involuntary servitude. And also here, the regulation goes beyond what's customary for the right, for the occupation, um, denying them to the right to a traditional and beneficial trade, thus violating the 14th Amendment, deprives the butchers of the privileges and immunities of the U.S. of U.S. citizens and denies their, uh, denies their, denies them property without due process of law and uh, equal protection. So, I mean, boy, they're getting a lot of stuff in here. And that uh, there's, um, public health does not necessitate having this monopoly here. So what we have here is also that the state of Louisiana is, um, they want the law to be upheld. So they said, this does not deny them the right to do this. It just says that they have to have their slaughter, they have to have their stuff slaughtered at the slaughterhouse. So they also say that the first section of the 14th Amendment has no meaning except for those of African ancestry. Uh, interesting. The privilege and immunity clause applies only to political privileges such as the right to vote and to hold office. So the police power extends to all subjects within within the, the state's territorial boundaries, and that power has never been conceded to the federal government. So um, they're saying the police power here gives Louisiana the ability to try to um, eliminate unhealthy and infectious articles and activities. So that's a lot of stuff for the court to um, unpack. Now, this is one of those situations, frankly, that um, you know, you know, when you when you start considering um, how the decision is going to come out, um, it's one where you where you kind of look at the, the things that different sides are saying, and then you start saying, "Huh, well, is the way that almost all nine of these people are looking at things." Is that the problem is is that are are they coming to is one of them maybe coming to a good decision for bad reasons or a bad decision for good reasons? So Justice Miller, there's Justice Miller, um, is a five to four decision. So he says that actually, if you read the Fifteenth Amendment, 
the only one that actually mentions uh, blacks more by name is the fifteenth uh, amendment, one on the right to vote, one on the right to vote. But the purpose of the other amendments were to invalidate laws against black people. But it doesn't say that other people can't raise claims. So he also says that the due process clause of the fourteenth amendment is nearly identical to that of the Fifth Amendment. So, you know, if you just start thinking about that, okay, they made this uh, basically kind of the same. Um, same here, the same there. Um, hmm. Maybe what they're trying to do is to kind of copy the Fifth Amendment and apply to states. Now, the thing is, what about the Privileges and Immunities Clause? That's not written in the Fifth Amendment. So it was meant to prevent forbid states from withholding privileges and immunities belonging to U.S. citizenship, state citizenship, making this more of a narrow ruling. So those privileges and immunities are only the rights found in the Constitution, so two citizenships were created by the 14th Amendment, state citizenship, federal citizenship. So also kind of what you see here is that the butchers were not deprived of their rights because they could still engage in a profession, but they just had to do it at the Crescent City Slaughterhouse. So what, what Miller kind of here is saying is, you know, he's also seeming to make, if you will, an argument against judicial activism. So basically not wanting to give the court the ability to veto state laws. So kind of um, how, how he concludes some of the things. Uh, unquestionably, this, is, this has... Uh, greater force to the argument and added a largely number of those to believe in the necessity of a strong national government. Kind of looking at some of the things about the 14th Amendment. So, but whatever fluctuations we've seen in the history of public opinion on this subject during the period of our national existence, we think that it will be found that this court, so far as its functions required, have always held that a steady and even hand balance between the state and federal government, and then we trust that uh, such may continue to be the history of its relation to that subject as long uh, as it shall have duties to perform a demand of construction of the Constitution or of any parts. Uh -huh. hmm. So, we have here are a couple of dissents, one by Justice Field, one by Justice Bradley. Um, the one by... Um, I believe by, there's actually a, a dissent also by Justice Swain that's not printed. Um, now, the dissent by Justice Field is joined by the others, Justice Chase, Swain, and Bradley. So, our Chief Justice, Chief Justice Chase. So, he believes that the provisions apply to all citizens, but he finds that the majority makes the 14th Amendment rather meaningless. He calls it vain and idle enactment. Um, that's not very nice. Is it? Um, so, so um, you know, it should be applied to state laws as well to, to protect private property interest against state legislation that violates it. So he says that the decision effectively gutted the privileges and immunities clause. So again, this is one of those things where um, where. You know, you just sit back there and say, yeah, the 14th Amendment is meant to apply to everybody. But um, is it going to be that during this period of time that the court mainly uses it for big business and um, big business, the wealthy and corporations, and really doesn't give that much effect for it for um, African-Americans, which kind of is the case during this period of time? Not, not completely, but... Justice Bradley, in his dissent, takes an extremely expansive view. So, notice what they're doing here, is that they are, that, that these justices in dissent really are saying, yeah, yeah, the, the, it applies to everybody, it applies to everybody. You know, they start thinking, oh, that's a good thing. Don't we want to have more rights? But is it essentially giving rights to big business, wealthy, and corporations um, against something that you might have heard talked about during the contract clause chapter, the public good. So he says that the 14th Amendment includes the choice of lawful employment. 
that bikes may have uh, been the intent of this amendment, but it's clear that it, pro it protects everybody. So he sees it as potentially encroaching on states' rights. Um, you know, so the Bradley dissent actually, um, this is one of those things where I would just tell you that the reason that we read concurring opinions and dissenting opinions is that depending on the makeup of the court later, it is a roadmap for whenever you get changes on the court. So sometimes you see somebody that may be seen as a weirdo, if you will. So, you know, maybe doesn't have very much support at all for their opinions. Um, think of William Rehnquist, the Lone Ranger on federalism. Clarence Thomas writing kind of a off-the-wall concurring opinion about guns in the Prince case in 1997. Think about Hugo Black talking about incorporation early on when he's on the court. Things that at the time we start thinking, oh, yeah, the person, they don't have any influence. But they start writing more. It picks up support. You have other people that eventually get on the court and vote in their favor. So one of the things Louisiana does, it amends its constitution to bar monopoly. So the Crescent City um, Company sued on the contract clause. The court rules against them um, based on contract clause precedent, saying that there was no, uh, what do you call it? Eh, what's the word I want to use? Um, uh, no case. So, one of the reasons that we look at these um, these three these three opinions here is that it it kind of gives us an idea of uh, where the court's going. So, Miller versus Bradley and Field kind of gives you an epitome of the opposing views on the subject. So, um, Mi Justice Miller in the majority said that there were no. Um, substantive um, protections in due process. So, this was not the end, though. So, remember back then, um, people didn't live as long. People didn't serve as long on the court. And, um, you know, while, while the court's always been important, I think that there just wasn't as much focus on it. Well, one of the things that Miller says a few years later in Davidson versus New Orleans. It is not a little remarkable that while due process has been in the Constitution as a restraint upon the authority of the federal government for nearly a century, its powers had rarely been invoked in the judicial forum or the more enlarged theater of public discussion. But while it has been a part of the Constitution, as a restraint on the power of the states, only a very few years, the docket of this court is crowded with cases in which we are asked to hold that state courts and state legislatures have deprived their own citizens of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. There is abundant evidence that there exists some strange misconception of the scope of the provision found in the 14th Amendment. So, one thing is, you know, this is what Justice Miller wrote. So why do you write this? One thing is, is that it didn't close the book. It didn't close the book. Um, and one thing that not doing so did, remember, if you have a 5-4 decision, all you need to do is get one vote changed if you still have the same four votes. So a lot of business interests were, were I mean, they were continuing to make these arguments. They were thinking, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can get... Justice Bradley's position on this. So, you have an interesting um, book called Constitutional Limitations um, by Thomas Cooley. Um, there's a law school named after him in Michigan. I think they actually call it Western Michigan University. Yeah. Uh, Western Michigan Law School. So, in this work, he talks about liberty. And a lot of what was coming out of this was social Darwinism. It was finding some footholds. Footholds. Basically, the government shouldn't get involved. You know, if you think about social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. 
you know, that if the fittest survive, it would have a better effect on the country long term. So what that kind of comes about is laissez-faire. Kind of Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, though, the thing is, if you actually read Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, um, it's always been misinterpreted that he wants no government regulation when it's not the case of what Adam Smith argues, but that's that's for another story in the economics course that you might take. But basically, leave the gov government, leave business alone. Um, what's going to happen is if you just let business just do whatever it wants, um, everybody's going to benefit. The consumer's going to benefit. Every, everybody's going to benefit. I think that one of the problems, of course, of that is, is that, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, you just think about pie, you know. You know I mean, some people try, oh, yeah, we're going to create more pies. But if there's only so much pie, and if, uh, you know, if, if one side takes most of the pie, then there's not enough pie for everybody else. So, one thing is, is that um, social Darwinism got a lot of um, footing in social elite business, but, but not among kind of ordinary Americans at the time. So the other thing is, is that the Supreme Court's docket was very crowded back then. They heard a lot of cases, and up until the Everts Act, part of the year they were going riding circuits being a circuit court judge, too. So, one thing is, this in our next case, is Munn versus Illinois. So the court upheld a state regulation we're going to find, but created a little bit of a loophole, if you will. So, you know, we'll see that Justice Field and Strong are in the dissent here um, with the uh, um, majority, opi or majority opinion by Justice Waite. But, so, kind of the background here is that um, Chicago... You know, we think of Chicago, you know, kind of the capital of the Midwest. Um, at some point, we kind of called it America's second city. Now, um, I think Houston actually might have more people, so it's kind of, kind of like the fourth city. Um, you know, it, it's a city that um, the Midwest Political Science Conference is at every April. Um, but what made Chicago, um, the location on the Great Lakes, and kind of its location being the agricultural capital of the country. So, where did a lot of grain that were being produced by farmers throughout the Midwest and Great Plains go? Chicago. So, one thing is, is that with a lot of grain, um, you know, what do you use a lot of grain for? Um, you can use the grain for a lot of things. Um, one big thing is, of course, to feed livestock because they're going to eat different grains and things. But, you know, other things might be used in, in other products. So, you know, you might have uh, uh, wheat berries stored, um, you know, to make cereal or different things. You know, for instance, uh, I just made um, kutia, which uh, is a Ukrainian dish, um, which uh, uses wheat berries, poppy seeds, um, nuts, dried fruit, and honey. Ah, huh, there you go. Um, it's very delicious. If you want the recipe, send me an email. I'll get it to you. Um... Actually, if uh, if you were listening to this in real time and you were, um, and we were on campus, uh, I might actually have some in, there in my refrigerator on campus, but uh, um, it's not the case. Um, but storing grain. One thing is is that these grain storage. So if you've ever seen um, grain elevators, I mean. You know, at the time, they would rival the biggest buildings in America. So, you know, you know, you, you, you basically kind of load them from the top and you get stuff out from other places. Um, you've probably seen grain elevators in different places. So, storing was a big business. So, a lot of grain storage companies came up. So, a really successful one was Munn and Scott, owned by Ira Munn and George Scott. So they started one warehouse with a capacity of 8,000 bushels of grain, short period of years. Um, they uh, um, had storage capacity of 2.7 million bushels. That's a lot. 
But one of the problems is, is that uh, they were, a lot of people thought that they were crooks. That they were, uh, you know, not very honest. So, with their business practices, high fees, mixing grain types, price fixing. Um, so, you know, you're mixing inferior grain with superior grain. Um, so, it became more and more obvious. So, farmers and merchants, so basically they were... They were kind of taking over the uh, business there. Um, so the state came in. So you had the Granger movement. So if um, most of the time I don't have that many students that grew up out in the country like I did. Um, if you ever heard of Granges, so the Granger movement. So in 1871, there was a law passed in Illinois that uh, establishes board to regulate the maximum grain storage uh, prices. Uh, and other aspects. So the state said that this was compatible with the Constitution, uh, which said that um, that they were subject to the power of regulation. So the state of Illinois, because they were not very honest, were charged a convicted with the law and fined a hundred dollars. So the allegations actually um, led to their bankruptcy amid the allegations of ethical and professional impropriety. So they challenged the constitutionality of the law. So, the question is, is that this violate equal protection and due process under the 14th Amendment? So, for Mudd and Scott to strike down the law, they said that it's part of interstate commerce and foreign commerce, therefore states don't have the power to regulate. It's something, it's an argument more that you'd look at in Political Science 303, but it is one of their arguments. But the big one for us is that it encroaches on a liberty and private property in violation of the due process clause. And it valid use of the police power uh, you know, involves public morality, you know, causes disease, crime, and pauperism, not to control wages and prices. So they're saying also this is not a public utility. You cannot regulate this like public utility. Uh, remember, the one thing about a public utility as far as uh, regulation is, by its very nature, a public utility is a monopoly. So, you know, it, just think about this. Um, if you if you live in, if you live where I live in Williamsville, um, I have national fuel and national grid, one for gas, one for power, uh, one for gas, one for electricity. Um, it's not like whenever whenever I moved in, somebody said, oh, well, you've got these choices for your natural gas, you've got these choices for your electricity. Um, I was kind of, it's one of those things where, okay, you can have electricity or you cannot. Um, it's not really that easy to probably live in Williamsville without electricity. And it's not going to be very easy to live in Williamsville or Buffalo or Tonawanda or Cheektowaga or Hamburg, Orchard Park, anywhere probably outside of maybe, you know, like Florida or San Diego to live without, uh, to live without heat. So it unreasonably and arbitrarily deprives them of their freedom to carry on their business activities. So they are basically saying that they should be able to charge whatever they want to. Let the market take care of it. Uh, there, there's, it's not the one from this case, but to give you an idea what some of these, uh, uh, today, what some of these green elevators would look like, um, uh, there's, there's a good example. You can see, you can see that they're, they're actually filling, um, I believe that's, uh, um, so it's near a ra rail, so they're filling um, cars there. So the great state of Illinois, the land of Lincoln, wants to uphold the law. They're saying this is not interstate foreign commerce. It's only local business. You know, as a part of internal commerce, um, the state can regulate these things, um, things in public warehouses. There's no deprivation of property rights. You can still use it as uh, as you want to. And then they try to make more of a um, public utility argument that food is so important that it should be allowed to be regulated more than other industries. Now, Chief Justice Waite. Yes. Uh, sometimes I always want to uh, make sure that, I don't, so there was a Chief Justice Waite and then a Chief Justice White. Um, uh, not related either. Uh, so he said the word deprive is not defined in the Constitution. So looking back in England, um, colonial times, um, there were maximum charges for certain services. So when property is devoted to a public use, it's subject to public regulation. So when it involves a public good, the states have the power to regulate. You know, it's property affecting the public interest. So grain is um, for public use. 
um, and subject to state regulation. So one of the things that the court kind of creates as a result of this case is the business affected public interest doctrine. But here's the problem. If you're, if you're somebody, here's the good thing, let's say, if you're, if you're Justice Field and Bradley, which, uh, Justice Bradley is actually on the court at this time and he joins the majority, but uh, for Justice Field, is that he didn't close the door on economic substantive processes Miller had done in that case. So, uh, Justice Miller is still on the court, by the way, too. Um, so it opens the door a little bit. So, the the kind of the justice field position is rejected in the case but not completely so certain things so when so you know there's they're saying here you know kind of looking at the fact that uh, you know you know we're looking at 1877 um you know we had the slaughterhouse cases in 1873 um the, they're, they keep trying to get cases up to the Supreme Court. So, hoping that maybe you get a little bit different result. So, we have kept the cases long under advisement in order that the decision might be the result of our mature deliberations. Justice Field, joined by Justice Strong, said, you know, this gave us, this, he said, this is giving states all types of uh, great powers. Um, you know, it goes against private property rights, uh, unrestrained license to legislative will, um, which the thing is, mm -hmm, well, you know, we do have kind of a democratic form of government, you know, maybe, maybe you ought to let the elected representatives do stuff, but not according to Justice Field. So this regulation violates the property rights of Mr. Munn and Scott. So it's forcible dispossession, make it make except less than he wanted. It's a restriction devalues his private property. There is no cause for this regulation. So here's the problem is that Justice Miller in the slaughterhouse cases basically said, no, 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 no. We're closing the door on you. But do we have a loophole? Is the door been opened? You'll learn if you're actually going, if you become a lawyer later, um, there's some things in, in evidence law. It's called opening the door. Is this kind of opening the door? Now, the American Bar Association, now as we think is quite more liberal, um, back then it was uh, new. A lot of business-oriented attorneys. So, they wanted to see this case, they wanted to see Slaughterhouse overturned. So, one thing they said is, so it is not surprising that Waite's majority opinion has generally been regarded as a great victory for liberalism and judicial refusal to recognize due process on the substantive legislative regulatory power. But is that correct? Huh. Huh. That's a big one. So, Waite really didn't take the same approach that Miller did in Slaughterhouse. He didn't do a um, complete rejection. You know, you've got this business-affected public interest doctrine against the Munn claim. So, you know, but it was the fact that um, this was kind of a unique situation, if you will. So, Justice Field basically saying, you know, okay, no, 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 thing is their weight. Um, you opened the door a little bit, you still ruled it the wrong way, but you didn't give enough protection um, against government regulation. There is hardly an enterprise or business engaging the attention and labor of any considerable portion of the community in which the public was not an interest in the sense that the term used by the court. So you get with the business affected public interest doctrine, kind of a little bit um, of yes and no. Maybe. Muggler versus Kansas. 
eight to one decision with Justice Field. That should be Field, not Friend. Um, that should, Field, no, Fiend. Uh, I guess I must not like Justice Field for some reason. Um, so it involved a challenge to the manufacture and sale of liquor in the great state of Kansas, the Sunflower State, which I think is probably not making the liquor out of sunflowers. Um, I don't know what they're making their liquor out of. So liquor, not beer. So, but it said not every statute enacted ostensibly for the promotion of public interest to be accepted as a legitimate exhortation of police powers of the state. They were limits to states' regulatory powers. So, if a statute purports to regulate public health, morals and safety has no connection to those, the court can adjudge. Uh, the court can adjudge. The court is going to start to be a sub, uh, kind of a super legislature. So, the thing that you have to remember is that during this period of time, the court's docket is enormous. You know, you know, the, the kind of COVID, even post-COVID, I mean, the docket is like, Six is some, sometimes they aren't even issuing 60 K, 60, 60 um, opinions on the merits. I mean, they aren't doing a lot of work compared to how they were then. So, this helps to lay some groundwork for the Lochner Doctrine. So, one of the things that uh, Muggler. There are limits beyond which legislation cannot rightfully go. Ah, duty to a judge. So the state, the, the court didn't really fully go along with that. But the thing is, in Munn, Chief Justice Waite started getting his big toe in the door. Now the thing is, a few more toes are kind of inching through the door. So the door is not closing. The door is slightly opening. How much more is this door going to open? So that's a question of what we get in Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railway versus Minnesota. Striking down a law on procedural on due process grounds. So Minnesota law set up a commission to set equal and reasonable rates for railroad transportation of goods and warehouses. Storage. So remember, storage, transportation, big things in the economy, things where people can really um, screw you, let's say. So the railroad refused to abide by ruling of the commission. The Minnesota Supreme Court ruled against the company. So Minnesota loses on multiple grounds, though. No judicial review of the um, commission decision, which they said was a violation of procedural due process. But here is where we get... Uh, Here's where some of the stuff that uh, we start thinking, aha, and it's one of the aha moments. Under the Muggler standard, it was depriving the company of its property by not allowing for judicial review of the decision, by not being able to charge reasonable rates for transportation and storage. This was depriving them of the use of their property. The judiciary, uh, it's not just the big toe and some little toes. Ah, what are we getting? We're getting maybe a leg is moving in. Or maybe there are two legs moving in. So, you know, this was a, a decision by Justice um, uh, Blatchford here. So, the problem is, you know, if you were just looking at the procedural part, the no judicial review, you know, it's understandable. But, one thing is, the court composition had changed since the slaughterhouse cases. So during slaughterhouse, the court had said, "We're not going to. We're not." Five justices said, "We're not getting involved. We are not. We're not going to inject ourselves. We're not going to be a super legislature." So in this case, you started to get Thomas Cooley's position defining liberty in economic terms. Ah, uh, you are. Think about this. In Muggler, only one member of the Slaughterhouse majority, Justice Miller, remained. But two of the dissenters remained. By 1890, 
Mrs. Miller was gone. Also, Chief Justice Waite. So, their replacements on the court were much different. They had been kind of under the, tutel, the, the philosophy of Cooley and Spencer with social Darwinism. So, Justice Brewer replaced Justice Stanley Matthews, who refused to follow Munn as the state uh, the court of appeals judge. Oh. So it's not surprising that the slaughterhouse dissenters were starting to carry the day. There may be more to it. By substituting its judgment for that of state legislators in determining the fairness of regulations of property and liberty under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, the court was acting contrary to the public opinion that spurred state regulations. Political pressures upon state legislatures through the country had resulted in laws regulating business to what the courts were unwilling to sustain. So what you had here is that farm groups, progressive groups, new dealers, populists, a lot of their views were carrying the day with the public. They were electing, they were electing a lot of legislators in states. especially in a lot of farm states. So, you know, we think we think today of, of uh, kind of a lot of our more rural and farm states being very conservative, which the thing is, I mean, I think you have to say that rural areas definitely have moved to the right. Uh, having having been uh, the fact that I am from one, um, not now, of course, because I'm in Erie County, but, you know, definitely in the Trump era um, and even a little bit before that and during the Obama era, you saw rural areas kind of, but really during the Trump era, um, kind of 2016 and forward, um, you know, rural areas are really moving away from the Democrats today, which are the more um, progressive and liberal party. Um, but at the time, you know, a lot of populist, populism um, by farmers and things back then. Because, of course, one of the things is you just have a lot more farmers. Um you know, I mean, even in what we call our farm states, there aren't that many people that are actually farmers. Now, you might have people that benefit from uh, um, farming. Um, you know, like if you owned, uh, like if you worked at uh, John Deere dealership. I mean, there are a lot of things where if you're a far that the farm economy. But The one thing you have to think is, it's not just think about this, who's going to benefit? Because I think sometimes that, um, you know, we can sit and just look at things in a, uh, in you know, like a, like a view from just looking down. But even the most mundane of laws are going to have an effect on somebody. So our last case for today is Al Geyer versus Louisiana. So one thing is, is that, uh, you know, we had seen changes in Mugler and in the Chicago, Milwaukee and St. Paul railway case. Boy, the court still the court is going to move even further, kind of into this more pro business era. So today we think of Louisiana as being a very conservative state, which it is today. But boy, it's a state that has a lot of history of populism and progressivism. Um, it turns out what kind of um, clipped a lot of it is the fact that of the oil industry it made the state more conservative. Um, as you know, this is the state that gave us the Long family, Huey P. Long, chicken in every pot, every man king. Of course, Huey Long is not uh, in office in 1897. He, he is alive, I think, um, from uh, Winfield. You can actually, if you look on that map, um, if you see uh, if you see where there's like a, a fighter fighter jet, if you kind of look kind of to the southeast of there, there's Winfield where the um, Long family's at. Um, interestingly enough, um, like a few years ago, 
was the first time in like a hundred years that there was no person in the Wallen family holding political office in Louisiana. It's also Winfield is home of the Louisiana Political Hall of Fame. Um, someday I would like to go there. The thing is, I just don't know what the hell I do in Winfield because it's kind of, uh, kind of a desolate place. And if you ever looked at Louisiana, doesn't it look like a little little stool or a little little chair you could maybe sit on? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. Maybe. I probably I've been to New Orleans. Um, that's where they have the Southern Political Science Conference every few years. A lot of good food to eat. Very good. But I digress out of the great state of Louisiana. So what you had here was that um, even before the longs, more progressive legislation. Um, so Louisiana was a state that, uh, you know, um, was black people weren't voting, but uh, the white population was not nearly as conservative as in a lot of other places in the South at the time. So you had more populism kind of going on. So it prohibited citizens and corporations from doing business with an out-of-state insurance company unless they complied with a specific state of set of regular requirements. So I think you can see some things that are going on here. So one thing is they had to have a place of business within the state and have an authorized agent in the state. Well, just think about this. This is before 1900. Um, it was not easy to communicate. So we would not be having online courses. Um, you know, if you wanted to communicate me with me, if uh, let's say we were at LSU and I was teaching this class, um, probably wouldn't be a lot of law to teach, but uh, um, if I was teaching this class at LSU, um, one thing is, if I was teaching this class at LSU, um, I'm thinking that there are probably a number of people that are listening to this probably that would be prohibited from attending LSU because of race and uh, potentially because of gender. Um, I don't know if there was actually gender prohibitions at the time at LSU. I don't think there were, but there just wouldn't have hardly been any um, female students. To the point to now where we actually, um, um, for for several years, you know, the majority of uh, college students are actually women. But there are reasons that you can think about this. Now, some of it probably is to favor in-state businesses. I mean, let's be honest about that. Um, so, I mean, the one thing is, is that um, if you want to communicate with somebody, mail and telegraph. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not like you could, um, you know, I mean, I'll tell you this. Um, you know, you know, one thing that I think some people just kind of, uh, you know, forget about is that, uh, you know, in most of your lives, you've been able to been able to communicate relatively easily with people. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember that when we didn't have cell phones, I remember when you first had a cell phone, you got like a hundred minutes or something. And, you know, the thing looked like a brick. He said the purpose was to prevent fraud from just not having fly-by-night uh, um, companies getting in here. So Algar purchases some maritime insurance from an out-of-state company. So it covered goods ship shipped from New Orleans, the port of New Orleans, to European ports. So um, back then, the port of New Orleans was, if you're on the Gulf of Mexico, it was the port. Because um, one of the things is a connection to the Mississippi River. The port of Houston had not been dredged. It was not that big. It didn't really have the port of Miami. Um, so it's kind of your big thing. So no employee of the out-of-state company ever entered Louisiana, and all the transactions took place by mail and tele telegraph. So he was fined for violation of the law and challenged it. So for so the question here is, did this violate the due process clause, which, according to Algar and the company, protects the liberty to enter into contracts and business of their choice? So, boy, you see what we're getting here. The right to contract. That, that, that right to contract, that is so important here. The right to contract. So for Algar said... It's a naked, unauthorized, and unreasonable invasion of his liberty. So it violates the 14th Amendment by denying liberty and property arbitrarily. 
and the terms liberty and property protect the right to conduct any lawful vocation or business, including the freedom to make contractual agreements with whatever insurer he wants to use. So here, Louisiana has no regulatory authority. None of this was done in Louisiana. So here, by prohibiting his use of the mail, um, they said it's also a violation of the, the law that creates the Postal Service, um, and also um, interstate commerce. So some other arguments there. So Louisiana said, yes, it did um, occur in, occur in uh, the state of Louisiana. So, you know, it wasn't determined until the cotton was loaded onto a ship in New Orleans. Therefore, it did take place. So under its police powers, the state may enforce requirements for out-of-state corporations to conduct business inside the state. Um, the state's police powers rest on its own sovereignty. This principle is unquestioned. So I think what we're seeing here is that you're also trying to see kind of an other argument that we kind of see today often made more by uh, conservatives, though, though not completely-ish, uh, um, making, making a state's rights argument, to, you know, we're a state. We should be able to do what we want to. Um, you know, laboratories are democratic. You know, I don't think we actually had the term yet until the fall came up with it. But same, same kind of stuff. So the Fourteenth Amendment doesn't apply. There's no bearing on this. We're 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 looking at um, fraudulent practices from outside of the state. Boy, guess what the result is here. It isn't five to four. It isn't 72. It isn't even 8 to 1. It is 9 0. Including Justice Harlan, by the way. In an opinion by Justice Rufus Peckham, Louisiana loses. The state violated, the state violated the 14th Amendment by depriving the company of its liberty without due process of law. So, boy, you're seeing that Spencer and the social Darwinism, and Thomas Cooley, boy, they are, uh, they're probably feeling pretty good after they got uh, the um, telegraph that said they won. Well, they didn't win, but their side won. The word liberty linked with substantive due process. The word liberty mentioned in the 14th Amendment means not only the right of the citizen to be free from the mere physical restraint of his person, as by incarceration, but the term deemed to embrace the right of the citizen to be free in the enjoyment of all his faculties, to be free to use them in all lawful ways, to live and work where he will, to earn his livelihood by any lawful calling, to pursue any livelihood or avocation, and for that purpose to enter into all contracts which may be proper, necessary, and essential to his carrying out of a successful conclusion to the purposes above mentioned. Where does Justice Peckham get this? Guess where? The Bradley descent in the slaughterhouse cases. <laughs> there you go. So more from Justice Peckham. Person has a right to contract with things like insurance without state interference. The company has a right to perform the act. The law is not reasonable. The state goes further to merge the freedom of contract with substantive due process. It goes further. I'm sorry. It goes further. State regulations are placed below liberty and contract after this case. So the court further strengthens its role in deciding which cases were found in violation. So it would make determinations, as they said, as each case arises. So, boy, one of the things is, is that, uh, is that the way that this is written, it basically just says, please, please come to the federal courts and challenge laws all over the country. And with the court being not as, uh, if you will, um, willing to, willing to, uh, um, 
denies certiorari. The court, in a lot of ways, becomes the super legislature. So I was kind of where did I want to put this uh, at the uh, in this lecture or not? Uh, I did. So one of the things is is that uh, with the court becoming kind of a super legislature, it's not that um, government regulation lost all the time. Now, one thing about Utah, um, one thing that we know it has a lot of, we know it has a lot of salt. Um, it's also um, the state that is the uh, world um, world headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, but one of the things that I think people, um, it's a place where they had the Winter Olympics. Mitt Romney lives in Utah today. Um, other people live in Utah. It's one of the fastest growing states in America. It's a beautiful state. I mean, just gorgeous state. Five national parks, the mighty five as they call them. I've been to four of them. The only one I think I haven't been to is Capitol Reef, um, which I think is the least visited. Um, so I think there you go. But it's also a state that has a lot of natural resources. So, you know, I have here our gifts of nature, mineral deposits. It has salt, in addition to salt, it has a lot of coal. It has uh, um, sand, gravel, manganese, tungsten. Potash, copper, uranium, palladium. What else does it have? Uh, shale, gravel, phosphate, um, silver, oh. copper, silver and gold. Remember that from uh, Frosty and the Snowman. So, <laughs> so just getting to this. Um, Holden versus Hardy. It was decided in the next year. Um, one thing is, is that um, I think this kind of goes with the last case, is that uh, not all cases that go up to the Supreme Court is the government going to lose. Um, they're going to lose in quite a few, but not all. So mining companies to work their employees more than eight hours a day, employees, emp opponents said it interfered with the rights of persons to contract for voluntary employment. Utah said it was for health and safety purposes. So using Muggler, the court ruled for Utah. So remember, you know, you go back to the Muggler case, is that, um, you know, you can, you, you, you can, you can have some things um, um, that are, that are designed to protect public health. You necessarily have to prove it. So they said it's because of the unique nature of mining. It was uh, uh, because of the unique um, public health ruling. So just as this Brewer and Peckham were in the dissent in this case. So so remember Brewer was somebody that really when he was a, when he was a lower court judge really didn't even want to uphold the precedent that the court had that, that the that the court had held, you know, that you're not supposed to do that as a lower court judge. You know, I just saw on here cuz I was looking at a larger version, uh, clay, zinc, lead, selenium, Rare earths, dolomite, limestone, cement. Boy, Utah's got it all. I don't even know what valerian is. Um, maybe somebody on here knows what it is. But as a result of this case, one thing that we kind of really see is this. The court... The Supreme Court, and remember, you 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 have where a lot of these probably are brought like at a state Supreme Court level, and they can go automatically to the U.S. Supreme Court. But you know, you're having lower federal courts hearing these cases too. So one of the things that this means is that the Supreme Court's docket explodes. They are hearing lots of cases. So rather than just kind of having more of a um, you know, let the democratic process play out. The court is saying, bring us more cases. Yeah, bring us more cases. Because there are quite a few of them that we're going to strike down. There you go. So, the court did find it was reasonable. 
so we kind of see what's going to be coming as sometimes one side will win, sometimes another side will win. But boy, by the end of this process, we see that big business and industry is in control. Again, I say this in every constitutional law course that I teach, and I teach a lot of them. I teach a lot of these courses. Court composition matters. Do not discount how much court composition matters. So we are done for today. So next time that we, the primary focus of our lecture will actually be on the Lochner Doctrine, so the rise and the fall. Um, it did go down to defeat after a period of time. So we'll be reading, um, again, three major cases, Lochner, Muller, and Atkins Children's Hospital. And we'll see some information about Louis Brandeis, who writes a very nice, very great brief, and then eventually ends up on the Supreme Court. But we will see by the 1920s. And then again early part of the Roosevelt administration. The court is very activist and very much against public opinion. And we'll see how that plays out. So until then, um, I will see you all later in our virtual space. And uh, stay safe. Be well. If you have any questions, please uh, send me an email. I'll be available, I think. Bye-bye.